Our first speaker today is Jared. Come on up, Jared. We'll get you set up. Um, Jared's great. We love Jared. Uh, you know, he's, he's been doing this for a long time. He, he, you know, he's, it's not that he's old. He's just been doing it for a long time. <laughs> and, um, you know, he does great stuff. He's got a, you know, he's got a great talk. will notice that from this talk, I bet. Um, this is a lot of effort to get this stuff together, so there are volunteers in the back. Uh, give them a round of applause, I think. Yeah. <laughs> from New York City, and I went to a lot of museums, and it largely informed my path into information architecture, so I'm really excited to be giving this. So, about art, we're going to dive, which is a really interesting work of information because Frank Lloyd Wright made a lot of decisions in this space that had never really been made in other physical museum spaces before, and like a startup story. So there's a lot of just general lessons about you know, running a digital business that can be called from here as well. So like I said, it's a personal story for me. And here this is kind of where it all starts. This is Computer Camp, circa 1983. Um, I... Um, it, to this day, that is a feat of engineering I have done, uh, I think. And then, not too long after that, I was a really bad teenager, and my parents had to send me away. Uh, I was a really bad teenager. And they sent me here. This is Storm King Mountain. Uh, Storm King Mountain is known for three things. It's really fine. Right down the road, on the other side of the mountain, our school might be next. And the third thing it's known for is this place. This is the Storm King Arts Center. And this place blew my mind. This was one of those like teenage experiences where I'm like forming my view of the world and like I don't get here and I don't really understand what's going on. Because like I said, I grew up in New York City. One of the things that happens when you grow up in New York City is on a lot of field trips because it's a museum as a class, it's a city as a classroom and there's world class museums everywhere. So by the time I got here, whether I was aware of it or not, I had a about 30, 40 feet high. They're enormous. It's really, as content, as information, it's really radical. It doesn't fit in the context of what I thought a museum was. It doesn't fit contextually, and it doesn't fit physically. This is this giant pasture that's 560 acres. By the way, if you it's about an hour to go do it, it's totally worth it. Um, the environment that it's in is, turns out to be just as radical as the content itself. It's huge, it's imposing, and it's dynamic. It's kind of hard to see here, but what's going on here is, I'm going to say this is probably late spring or maybe early fall, so what happens is the ground cools overnight and then the sun comes out and warms the air and the cool ground creates this fog effect that starts to creep across the mountains. And, and this equally crazy environment that has this sort of tension between it. They're sort of fighting for attention. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, I think it's useful to think of art as information or content and museums as the interfaces through which we access that content. So this is a really radical interface for really radical content. Here's another piece. This is a favorite. This is Menashe Kaddishman. Easily fit underneath that thing, and it sits in the middle of this long pasture, and just for a sense of scale here, like, so there's people, they're in the foreground, they're probably 20, 30 yards from, and then like, you look further back, that's like another 50 yards back, and that, that thing looks bigger still, like, these pieces are gigantic, the largest piece I think is about 90 feet tall, it's this, this tension, they understand that space is actually part of the content that, that they're producing. And many of them begin to start to really break down the boundaries of what that means. So this is not Vietnam Memorial. This is So they're kind of the same thing. But in this case, we're looking at this from an angle here. What works is uh, you pick an area of focus your senior year. You spend six months. 
museum marketing and acquisition strategy and climate control and curatorial techniques. Museology is really the Is it the number of pieces? Is it, I don't know, it doesn't really feel like a museum. There are buildings at the Storm King Art Center that have galleries. Are those museums? I don't know. And then it gets into things like what are the ethics of running a museum? What are a, what's a role in society, yeah. right? But rarely do they say, we're not really sure if this is a, a, a real piece or not. They're, that's not really what they do. And I sort of walked into this field, and I think how we're presented with museums growing up is they are sort of these hallowed spaces, right? They are sort of the arbiters of culture, and they sort of preserve what is the best about our society. And when I really got into studying the field, that turns out they're not the case, that these are actually highly political organizations with agendas. Um, and they're... But... ...frames. And the reason for this is that these are the rooms that house the French painters. And this is by design. There is a secret or maybe not so secret nationalist agenda at the Louvre where they want you to walk away thinking the French painters are the best ones. Anybody know who this is? No? This is Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, this is the artist that really serves as the cornerstone to the Guggenheim. And he's doing some really interesting thinking. This is all and the whole thinking behind this movement is grounded in this sort of quasi-spiritual religion called the... And then you carry this out into the world. And this is some pretty heavy thinking for the early 20th century. And there are some parallels between that and the work we do, I think, right? So this is a very linear view of, probably over -simpl overly simplified view of the field of experience design, right? Where we have users at one end, and devices with interfaces at the other, and kind of the space we're all really interested in is like the space in the middle here, right? So that may be our medium, and these may be our audience, but this is what we're really designing, that stuff in the middle. And if you apply an information or a content layer to that, the stuff that sits behind the interfaces, we end up with something like this, and it's not a big stretch, you know, to see it in, for frame it as a mu in the museum context as well, right? But as I said, this is kind of overly simplified. More recent thinking says it's actually a little bit more like this. Uh, there are tech philosophers out there. This guy Peter Paul Bierbeck, who's very interesting, and they they work in the field of phenomenology and something called mediation theory, right? Which is what they're talking. What he would in this context, what it would mean was that these things. It's not actually this linear progression of person and content and interface and that what, what's actually happening is that all these things operate in an ecosystem. They all affect one another. So the interfaces we design and the way we organize information to create experiences are not, do not sit by themselves. What they really are doing is mediating our relationship with the world. And because they're mediating our relationship with the world, they are actually creating the world around a more simple way of saying this is that information and the context that it sits within can't really be separated, right? This is Vasily Kandinsky again, uh, composition number eight this is. And so he has this idea that by designing, by creating these works of art and by having people view them, that he's gonna resonate people's souls and they're gonna leave the experience of, of looking at his art, and they're gonna go make the world a better place. It's kind of a romantic vision, actually. And like I said, so this, this is a startup story, so let's talk about that for a little bit. This is Hilary Bay. Uh, Hilary Bay is sort of the unsung hero of the Guggenheim Museum. She's actually kind of a bad, I want her to be a proper young lady, and instead, She's running off to Berlin and to Munich, very non-traditional way for the for the.
Cubism has really hit its mixed up a lot of things. So the first thing he did was whitewash the interior, so now it's bright white. Check this out. See over here? The paintings aren't sitting flat on the wall. He doesn't get the whole 15 degree thing. He thinks it's weird. That's not how you do art. That's not how you do museums. So he did his best hack as he possibly could, and he pushes them away from the wall. So he stops to prop them up. This is what he does. They sort of end up floating in space. It's really kind of strange. Here's a picture from the side. And the critics agree. They think this is totally ridiculous. Here's a quote from uh, John Kennedy, who's the New York Times art critic of the day. The experience is a battle between art and museum in which neither wins, but both come out badly maimed. It's pretty damning stuff. <laughs> but they get past this. They start to install things properly, but there are still content problems because the next wave of the next wave of artists are painting these huge canvases. So Abby Covert in her book, which has lots of great little nuggets, has the saying: "Ambiguity costs clarity, and exactitude costs flexibility." She's talking about taxonomy here, but taxonomy, as we all know, is very frequently how we navigate digital spaces, right? And I think it applies here, right? So this is an ambiguous, unclear, but really flexible space, but it's not at all sympathetic. Whereas this is very exact, very clear, totally inflexible, and very sympathetic to the kind of content it's trying to illustrate. And the artists that are coming up are painting on these huge canvases, these color field painters like Barnett Newman, and Jackson Pollock. And these are really kind of appropriate to the theme of the museum itself. I mean, they're all trying to capture something expressive and push it outward. I mean, here's Mark Rothko. I mean, Mark Rothko is squarely in the religious space. This is one of my favorite art quotes, right? Of course, the flip side is that constraints also create some interesting opportunities. This is Alexander Calder. This is one of his mobiles. I don't know that one of his mobiles has ever been more effectively displayed. Without an environment like this, you couldn't like really get on top of the mobile or see what it's like from the side. Like, to me, this just like works perfectly. And you can't experience this kind of information unless you're in an environment like this. Here's Jenny Hulzer. Uh, she's well known in the 80s for like doing these really provocative digital messages that sort of slide along and she's asked to do an installation here and, and she winds her messages around the rotunda. Again, you can't really design something like this unless you have a structure like this. This is James Terrell, who's known for creating these sort of environmental and immersive uh, contexts. And what he does is he puts a canvas over the roof and he projects sort of the inverse of the rotunda up there. Um, and uh, you sort of sit there and you're like, whoa, and there's, there's, there's fog going through and uh, they, they, do, they do scents so you can actually smell. He creates this experience. Not really possible any other way. And then the museum evolves. They get a series of acquisitions. This is 1963. They get this collection called the Thanhauser Collection, which is a very important collection. They don't have a spot for it. So they take the small rotunda, which was originally designed for office spaces, and they sort of start tacking up art in there, and it's not really working so great anymore. And then they've got to repair it. 
So this is around 1989. There are serious structural deficiencies, as you can see. And then they build this addition right here. So this is how it exists now. The art world freaks out. The art world says, what is this? This was our beautiful gem at the side of the park, and they've put this back on it, and now it's the toilet bowl of the city. It's totally unfounded, because Frank Lloyd Wright had actually designed pretty much exactly the same thing in 1943. One of the big critiques of this space, of the addition, was that it was now blocking the city from behind it, but Frank Lloyd Wright hated New York City. There's a reason there's only one building here. Uh, he's perhaps infamously quoted as saying, there is no real architecture in New York City. So the guy who's in charge of this is this guy, Thomas Krenz, who's a, just a total D-bag. And <laughs> his commission immediately prior to this was Mass MoCA, which is the, Massachusetts, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Arts up in northern Massachusetts. And his idea for that was to turn it into a basic giant, basically a giant shopping mall for art. Um, but he oversees the expansion. They kind of follow the same formula with Bilbao, Spain, and it totally works. It transforms the region. And then they go too far. Does anybody remember this? This was down in Soho. This is the Guggenheim in Soho. Now it's a Prada store, which is ironic because I think one of the last exhibitions they did was a Prada exhibit. Um, it goes bust by 2001, and here we're definitely too far. We're down the rabbit hole where you've got the Guggenheim in Las Vegas at the Venetian. Sort of gotten back to their core mission. This is Abu Dhabi, slated to open 2017. And to me, it looks beautiful. This was entry. I think it's open now. So if you go to IXDA, I think is in Helsinki this year, you can go visit the Guggenheim, it's there. So what do we learn from all this? One, build alliances. Hilla was like this masterful person who like got all these really high power people involved. This is a photo called Hilla and her dogs because there are actually dogs in the picture, but her dogs are actually Kandinsky and Ferdinand Larger, who were like two of the most preeminent artists of the time. And she had them at her side, like helping make decisions. So to that, I would say, if you're in a large organization, form alliances. The structure is more important than the particulars, right? He didn't give up on the rotunda. He knew he wanted this space, but when he started to fight about color, he said, okay, right? Your context matters. So this is uh, Storm King Art Center again. Now we're looking at it in the fall, right? Now what happens, again, with this kind of, inter with the interface at the Storm King Art Center, like in the fall, it's totally different. They're bright red. You can go in the winter, after a, when this thing is a snow field, the whole thing is bright white, and you can, there's snow on the art. Like, it completely changes the way you think about it. And I think really what we're saying is that the context matters, right? It's not just about organizing information. That's not enough anymore. This is IKEA's catalog from 2014. This is practically stale by now, but like, they understand that like, an object in a catalog isn't as meaningful as the object in your home. So the Guggenheim really to expand and become this really this iconic multinodal global art organization that is really unparalleled in the art world. And at the same time, we need to challenge the embrace your constraints. Again, I think the constraints of the museum lead to some of the best work that's out there. And I think the same can be said for you know these devices we all hold in our hands or on our wrists or on our jeans nowadays, right? Is that when we work in these strains. In, in these, within these constraints, new opportunities emerge. And finally, have a relationship with your information space. This is an app that a friend of mine, space, and then when you're back in that space, you can revisit it. 